BioBalance HealthCast, episode 251, Obesity Causes Cancer. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. I'm not a physician, I'm a therapist. My skill set involves watching people, looking for patterns, studying their nonverbals, trying to, to diagnose what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing as a pattern in their lives and, and be able to help them. One of the things that I enjoy about working with Dr. Maupin is she is a physician who carries around inside her brain <laughs> gazillions of facts that she can just access when she needs them. I mean, it's like push a button and a number tumbles out or a label tumbles out or a memory of a diagnosis or whatever it may be that she carries in her head. But in our conversations together and doing these podcasts, one of the things that I'm learning is the complex interweaving of all of that stuff. We, we've been focusing on the last several weeks on podcasts that talk about diseases like diabetes and obesity and cancer mm-hmm. and what is evolving from those discussions is how interconnected they all are. Mm-hmm. And today we want to talk about that some more. We want to specifically focus on the connection between obesity, which includes type 2 diabetes, mm-hmm. and cancer. Uh, and the importance of, as a cancer treatment, reducing obesity and reducing weight. And what new information and knowledge is mm-hmm. now available for physicians who, who keep up with all of this and, and for patients who you know, are chasing the internet to research this information, the, the newer thoughts. I mean, in, in the last, uh, what is it, 25 years, the average weight of an adult American has increased between 20 and 40 pounds. Which is really dangerous. Yeah, so so we're, on average, all of us are 20 to 40 pounds Mm -hmm. over what we were 25 years ago. And now we have have a new drug. And, you know, we're always talking about new things for you to learn. And we, yes, he did say that, but that wasn't exactly the same as this. So we've had a big problem as physicians not in my office, but in normal physicians' offices, saying, go lose weight, and then walking out of the room. Right. That doesn't work, Mm -hmm. and it never has worked, because the patient's still sitting there going, how, and what what should I do? And even though there's all these different diets that are on the Internet or any on television, there's a specific diet that works for each patient, and there are ways for us to evaluate them to figure out which would be the best diet. But in general, even when we give a patient a diet, and that's probably why the doctors leave, they aren't going to follow it because it's too difficult mm-hmm. to be hungry. It's too painful to be hungry. So the most this is a very impressive discovery. They figured out that there is a, a hormone called GLP-1, and that some of us genetically don't have enough of it. Okay. And those of us who don't have enough of it are hungry all the time. So for those that have willpower, I mean, a lot of times people get tired of, especially uh, when they have family or friends or themselves that struggle with weight, they get to a point where they say, you just don't understand. I've done all these things and they don't work for me. I can't lose weight. You know, I've had bariatric surgery. I've eaten my way through it. I've taken drugs. I've gone on diets. And I've even exercised. if you haven't had bariatric surgery, if you've tried every yes. every diet many times, mm-hmm. that could mean that they tried one thing but didn't do the other. Like they yes. did a diet, but they didn't. But that particular patient didn't stop drinking. Or well, yeah, you that, even find or it they, new medicines. Yeah, that many medicines. You still have to do the work and it right. does take willpower but willpower doesn't get you through starving or feeling like you're starving and if you so have a genetic if you have this deficiency, problem your hormone deficiency that is genetic then your willpower alone is not going to help you lose weight you're hungry all the time and that's all you can think about and so the GLP1 deficiency is also something that causes diabetes again the the progress in information when i was in school many many years ago they taught us that people that had chronic, never-ending hunger suffered from a ventromedial hypothalamic lesion <laughs> in the brain. 
and that they only discovered that Some when they may, did but... an autopsy. <laughs> But their scanning techniques have gotten better, their equipment has gotten better, and their research has gotten better, and now they know that that may be a cause, but it's not the cause. But it may be secondary to a hypothalamic Lesion. abnormality or yeah. just a genetic uh, small hypothalamus or poorly functioning one. You have, to, you have to work it back, but where they figured this defect out is, is in the liver and in the pancreas. And so GLP-1 is secreted there, and if you don't have enough, they need to replace it. So they have a drug called Victoza, which we've talked about before in terms of diabetes, because it's one of the few diabetes drugs that actually makes you lose weight. And the reason it makes you lose weight is it increases your GLP-1. Mm -hmm. So it helps you lose weight because you're not hungry all the time. Right. Now... There's so many reasons you could be hungry all the time besides genetics. Stress. If stress causes Depression. you to have increased cortisol, which makes you hungry all the time. Mm -hmm. Depression decreases your serotonin, which could which could be working through GLP-1. We aren't sure about that, mm -hmm. but causes you to be hungry all the time. Eating carbohydrates. More carbohydrates you eat, the hungrier you are. If you, if you stop eating carbohydrates, interestingly enough, in two weeks... You stop being quite as hungry unless there's a genetic defect. So we found that... If you, if you can do it for two weeks. If you can do it for two weeks, then that would help. But people who, who need GLP-1 agonists, mm -hmm. like Victoza or now a drug called Sexenda, which is the exact same drug, but it's it's meant for weight loss, and it comes in a bigger, uh, bigger uh, injection and a more expensive injection, but one that carries you through using a higher dose to decrease your, your hunger. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to say is obesity is a huge problem. Obesity is hard to fix when you just ask people to take change their lifestyles. Right. And you need help. So this is one of the ways that you can be helped. So the research that we're running across recently is saying that doctors are cancer doctors in particular are becoming aware of the connection between obesity and obesity caused cancers mm -hmm. and part of what they're learning is that when they address the cancer they also have to address the weight and so they are trying to develop team approaches the team being the patient the patient's family and friends and the medical professionals mm -hmm. that are involved they've learned that doctors can't just focus on the cancer on the chemo on the radiation on whatever that they have to actually acknowledge and talk to the patient about the patient's weight that if they don't do that, then the patient tends to categorize or segregate the information about the cancer from the information about weight. And they concerned. tend to have recurrences or they tend to not get better from the chemo. So losing weight, and you always think of cancer patients getting really skinny, but they don't always, in, in many cancers you don't. Um, and if you stay obese, then you have you have a higher chance of failing the treatment. So this is... this is. And it seems to be a particularly aggressive concern for women. Mm -hmm. Men... It's much more... Obesity-driven cancers occur in 4% of men with cancer. Obesity-driven cancers occur in 7% of women with cancer. Mm -hmm. So they really do have to pay attention to it. And, it, and it's a complex thing. I mean, when you get a cancer diagnosis, doctors are beginning to recognize... Uh, one way to frame it is that's a teachable moment. They have your full attention and you're afraid of dying. I mean, it's people, even though most people like no longer attack. die from cancer, we still hear cancer as a death sentence socially, psychologically. So doctors have to work really hard to say, wait a minute, this isn't a death sentence. There are lots and lots and lots more people every year that survive cancer mm -hmm. because we're learning more about it and how to treat it. It should be a wake-up call. It is a wake-up call to, to make a life change. And so it's a teachable moment, and that's why we are emphasizing for those who aren't current on the research that it is important in that teachable moment to say we also have to talk about your weight, not as an addendum, but as an integral part of fighting your cancer. It's because, not always about self-control. I mean, you talk right. about self-control. Right. Yeah, it's self-control somewhat, but a lot of times self-control is just gone after you've beaten your head against the wall for so long. So, so the good so, news is so it's we not, have we have ways to deal with it. It's not just about self control. What what we're finding is a cluster of attack 
skills or attack points for fighting cancer, for fighting obesity, for fighting diabetes type mm -hmm. 2. And those involve medicines that are specific, the GLP-1 uh, agonist. agonist that increases your level of GLP and reduces your level of never-ending physiological hunger. We're not mm -hmm. talking about psychological hunger. That's physiologic a whole other conversation. Uh, the development of tailored exercise programs to complement diet programs mm -hmm. that are encouraged and monitored by the physician's office, but which the patient and the patient's friends and families have to do. I mean, find an exercise buddy. Find somebody to work out with you in the way that you can work out. If you, if you can start by walking a thousand yards, get somebody to go with you. Or get a Fitbit so yeah. that you get, you know, you may think On you walk 10,000 steps a day and then you go, oh, I've only walked 500 steps a day. That's not a good way to lose weight. You mm -hmm. have to, the reason they set 10,000 is because that's a good way to use up all the calories that we eat. Mm -hmm. So it's so there, there are apps on your phone. If you don't want to involve a doctor, then you can look at this, put your food in, put your exercise in, and, and also have it figure out your, your steps. So, so there's technology so that you most of us have this. with us that can facilitate our focusing and tracking. They can provide warnings. I mean, I, I have an app on my phone that sends me an email and says, you didn't walk today. You know, <laughs> you need to walk this far. It was on the charger. You know, uh, there are things that help remind me. I have a walk partner. We walk every day. We, we schedule times for it. When life interrupts those times, then our technology and, and our support remind us mm -hmm. that it, in a cancer situation, what the research is saying should be incorporated with a cross flow of information with the physician's office so mm -hmm. that they know that you're actually making the effort. What, what often happens in these situations psychologically is that the person who has the issue experiences attempts to be facilitative or helpful as the controlling parent, mm -hmm. as the mm -hmm. angry parent. You're trying to make me do something because that allows them not to be response able, right. not responsible. But respond. I'm I'm able to respond when I choose it, when I own it, when I recognize in that teachable moment. Holy cow! I've got to do something about this, even while I'm being afraid about cancer, and mm -hmm. I have to take ownership of that and commit myself to doing it. And it's and if regimented. I don't, it's you thinking about it. Yes. I know. And if if you if you say, oh, that's because somebody's trying to make me, then you don't think about it anymore. So, you, but you do have to think about your diet. You do have to plan your food. You well, do have to bring something with you to work so that you like nuts or protein shakes or something that gets you through the day without having hypoglycemia, which is change your consumption pattern. Not eating. That's it. You know, that's just as bad as yes. eating too much. Absolutely. So, I guess what I'm saying here is, don't let your doctor walk out of the room and say, you know, see ya. You have to you have to say to your doctor, wait a second, I need to know what type of diet I need, and that may mean he has he or she has to do some more testing. We do testing for weight loss. We have a weight loss program which we tailor to the patient, and we use the weight loss drugs, Qsimia or Bontrol or Fenteramine, which are anorexics. They keep you from being hung be, being hungry or wanting to eat, but the GLP-1 inhibitor, or excuse me, agonists also, also keep you from feeling hunger. Yes. Not, I mean, it's a different thing. One is wanting to eat. The other is feeling full physiologically. So those two together often work very well at helping you have enough, enough energy and feel good enough about yourself to go on with eating properly, change. it's not a diet, it's a change in lifestyle. It is a change in lifestyle, and that's the only thing that's successful over time. Most of us have been on diets for event or crisis points. You know, I need to lose 10 pounds so I can get in my swimsuit for my vacation a month and a half from now. Mm -hmm. uh, I need to lose weight so that at my daughter's wedding, I can fit into like the house. I can fit into a house. <laughs> dress. Exactly. I mean, p people do that. They lose weight. And then when the event is over, the circumstance is over, they immediately go back. Uh, I used to teach high school. And one of the chronic concerns that I had with the kids that I worked with is wrestlers uh, and cheerleaders mm -hmm. were highly at risk for losing weight. Like wrestlers lose weight to wrestle mm -hmm. down. They want to bulk up and have the muscles. Then they want to famish themselves before a match because they'd so be they weighed. in a lower mm -hmm. weight 
for, because they're more likely to win the event. Mm -hmm. Cheerleaders chronically are worried about their weight. They want to be flyers. They want to be the small one. They, they you know, whatever. And our society's message is about women's body shapes and so on. But mm -hmm. we used to have problems because the cheerleader sponsors to raise money for uniforms and trips and so on, mm -hmm. would have candy sales. Right. And I mean, so here you have these cheerleaders totally who are obsessed about their weight already, who have a responsibility to raise $500 in candy sales. You know, and they're mm -hmm. eating the candy. There's a lot of mixed messages these, oh in our gosh. society about it was that. Horrible. It's horrible. I mean, we tell people to be thin and beautiful, and we have models that look thin and beautiful, which is is... A good, it would be a good example if they weren't emaciated. So, so I think this year they, they've been a little less emaciated in the magazines. We're beginning to move in that direction. And, but and if we can look at them that way and not, oh, I, I'm, I'm failing, and then I, I'm going to go eat a Ted Drews or something because right. I'm failing. Mm -hmm. That's that's not a good idea. It's well, just all. It's put together with. Physiology, psychology, there's so many different elements. messages and yeah. elements in this. And I guess I want to stress today that you can't, I don't think most people can stick with a diet or with an exercise program unless they consciously decide to do this for the rest of their lives and mm -hmm. figure out how to set it, put not it into... Not to reach a goal, a set point. Not, not a goal, pounds. just yeah. this is your life and set that, but, but to get there. You're going to need help. You're going to need your doctor to help you to write a medication for you if you have had lots of failures in the past, and especially if you're over 40. So many of the ways we do this, I mean, we've had patients lose a lot of weight just on replacing their testosterone. And somehow, I don't know how that affects the GLP-1, but it seems to decrease their hunger. And it gives them more muscle mass, which burns more calories. Mm -hmm. So that's our first step. Some other people have other first steps. So if they're if our patients are over 40, we start with that. If they haven't lost weight, then we go over exercise routines. And they have to talk to us every four months. They come in for their pellets and they've got to they've got to talk to us about their weight. So if we can't get them to hormonally and you and use their um, and use their lifestyle to get them to the weight they want to be, then we have a weight loss program where we use medications to help them get to the weight they want to be. And then knowing they may gain a little bit and go back someplace to come back to so that we can reinstitute the medicine, bring them down to their weight and continue this lifestyle exercise and, and the hormonal support. So that's our method. Right. So, but that, we do use Victoza. We do use Sexenda. Right. Those are medications that I love to use. They're, I, they're fabulous new tools. I mean, they are. In the last five years. And part of the research that we're seeing suggests that if every American would lose two to two and a half pounds, and I'm not saying that that's the end. You're not. The research is saying that. <laughs> yeah. That there would be between 80 and 127,000 fewer cancers every year. Now, that's amaz an amazing, that is amazing number. Amazing. So it? we're right on that set point or obesity point where the triggers are firing. And what we're trying to provide the message is you can help yourself enormously if you absorb this message today and make a lifestyle change. You can't just go, it's not a panacea, it's not a magical thinking, you can't just take the pill, oh, I have Victoza, and not change your behaviors. Right. If you take Victoza and you still eat a lot of carbs or drink a lot of alcohol, which is taking a lot mm -hmm. of carbs, then they, they cancel each other out. Then you're going to be really frustrated and so, say, oh, those doctors lie, this doesn't work. That's true. That, that's not the point. The point is, it you you may be one of those individuals that needs a medical bridge. It's not a willpower. It's not just behavior. It's not determination. You need help to kick it in the right direction, and you shouldn't set a, a weight goal, a specific number. You should set a lifestyle goal. I'm going to be leaner. I'm going to be thinner. I'm going to be more active. I'm going to be focused on taking care of myself. I'm going to be conscious of what I eat. I mean, those are lifestyle changes. When you eat in front of the TV, when you eat when you read, when you eat when you're upset, when you eat uh, to reward yourself, I mean, all of those things compound their contributions to your risk of diabetes type 2, cancer, uh, and obesity. And all what, together. what this describes is. The psychological yes. standpoint. So sometimes 
I send my patients to counselors too. Yes. In addition to which is how we met. all of these other things, then if yeah. they can't psychologically stop eating when they're upset, like they say, well, my family, everybody gets upset. They sit in a room, they get a big bowl of ice cream, and I mean a big bowl, and then just sit and eat ice cream until they go into a coma. Well, that's something you learned as a child. You have to be able to psychologically stop that mm -hmm. because that's not healthy. <laughs> I'm sorry, but a little ice cream's okay. A lot of ice cream is not healthy. And that's not going to help the problem at all. Well, but you have to psychologically... Yeah. Try to stop smoking, put on 20 pounds. Why did I do that? Because I'm just putting stuff in my mouth as a way to calm my anxieties, to feel better, because it's a habit. You know, one of the things that um, I want to leave in in uh, at the end of this it, for people to remember mm -hmm. is when you sit down at a meal, are you more interested in the food you're eating or the people you're with? Because you should be more interested in the people you're with, especially on holidays where everybody go, oh, I want to gain weight over the holiday. You don't have to gain weight over the holiday. If you're talking to the people that are at the table that you don't get to see very often, you don't eat as much. And that's much more important for your your soul than it is you, for you to, I mean, it is, it is no, not I, good for I you. I so agree with you. You know, and, and if you're not with people that you love, if you're not with people that are interesting, if you're just by yourself eating, put your fork down between bites. Turn loose of it. And drink, it water, and drink water with your food because those will fill you, that'll fill you up or help fill you up. If that doesn't work, then you've always got doctors in us. So you can come see us. We'll replace hormones, go over exercise, figure out your diet, and then we've got the medications now. To really help maybe we can make a dent in cancer maybe we can make a dent in diabetes and now we know that alzheimer's also has to do with blood sugar so well, the, and obesity so, so at the end of the day we want to be able to say yes virginia there is a santa claus and his name is victoza <laughs> email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com you can find the biobalance healthcast on itunes and on youtube for more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit BiobalanceHealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash BiobalanceHealth. Find Brett Newcomb at BrettNewcomb.com.